Genesis chapter 33 and verse 1. <clears throat> and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. So Jacob, he lifts up his eyes and then he's able to look ahead and lo and behold, that's what and behold is referring to. Esau came, here comes Esau, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. So Esau comes with 400 men. Jacob gets scared, even though he gets that victory of praying and surrender to the Lord, his old nature kicks in again. He's afraid, just in case God might be wrong. <laughs> he divides the children, and then he divides Leah's children to Leah, Rachel's uh, son, Joseph, to her, and then the other two handmaids, the children that they gave birth, he divides uh, the two handmaids' children to them. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. So he puts the handmaids and their children at the, um, at the uh, front, and then Leah and her children behind them, and then Rachel and Joseph at the way back. That's what hindermost means. So foremost, meaning that the most front, so to speak. Hindermost, meaning like the most behind so to speak. So Joseph, we see his human nature side that kicks in again, a favoritism, favoritism that never left him. He always favored Rachel. The Lord's going to teach Jacob a valuable lesson after that. So Jacob's going to learn his lesson that he can't play favorites. Verse three, and he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near, near to his brother. So Jacob, he passed over before his family. He went up ahead, and then he bowed himself to the ground seven times in front of Esau. Can you imagine that? So he is very scared. So he's trying to show utmost reverence to his older brother. I don't know if he's thinking the same thing as he did with his gifts at the previous chapter, that if I bow down one time, he's still angry, but if I bow down the second time, then he's a little angry. If I bow down the third time, then Esau would go, oh, I, I'm actually better than Jacob. And then fourth time, oh, Jacob's really worshiping me, fifth and then sixth, seven. So that's what Jacob is thinking in his mind, probably. And then he bowed down seven times to the ground until he finally came near to his brother Esau. Now verse 4, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. So Esau runs to meet Jacob. <clears throat> he embraces Jacob and then he falls on his neck. So his face fell, landed on his neck, and then he kissed him and then they wept together. So Esau, we can see right here, that he went, uh, he went a total 180 from what Jacob was fearing. Jacob had all of this carefully thought out plan, if you recall, at chapter 32 and chapter 33, but notice his carefully thought out plan was a total waste of time. And remember, that's what we can learn from Jacob, is that we got to stop doing things our own way. We have to learn that valuable lesson. Because if you keep insisting and in doing things your own way, you will not have peace. You're going to be stressed out. And you've got to let things go and trust God. Basically, chapter 32 was a waste of time for Jacob. Except that part where he was praying to the Lord. That was the most valuable part. Verse 5, And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? So Esau lifts up his eyes like that, and then he sees the women and the children, that's the idea, and said, uh, who are those people with you? Jacob responds as follow, and he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. This guy, man. Jacob is still scared. So Jacob responds, oh, all these uh, are the children that are the ones that God had been so gracious to give to your servant here. Yeah. 
Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. So obviously the handmaidens were at the front, so they and their children came near to Esau, and then they all bowed themselves in front of him. Verse 7, And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. Also Leah and her children came near to Esau, and they bowed themselves in front of him. And after came Joseph near and Rachel and they bowed themselves. After that, Joseph and Rachel came near to Esau, and they bowed themselves in front of him. Now, uh, remember, my job is to explain each and every word, so if some of this sounds redundant to you, uh, just pay attention to the verse instead as you hear me, and see if what you hear from my explanation matches with the verse you're seeing, okay? If you do that, then you won't feel like it's redundant, slow, or a waste of time. Uh, I have to do that because that's the goal of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. That's what you intended to come here for. Amen. You intend to come here because you want to know every word from that book. So I am going to do that. <clears throat> verse 8, and he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? Esau, he <laughs> says to Jacob, uh, What meanest thou? So uh, what's all this drove, all these gifts, right? the cattle, sheep, and the gifts, the flocks that arrived to Esau, that I met across the way. What's the meaning behind this? That's what he means by that. And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau responds, oh, these are to find grace in the sight of my own Lord Esau. Keeps on, he keeps up that reverence stuff. Verse 9, and Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep that thou hast unto thyself. <laughs> Esau responds to Jacob, look, I got enough. Uh, my brother, I got enough. You keep it all. Now, Jacob, all of that was a waste of time, what he did again. All of that, what he did was a waste of time. <laughs> but it shows also how uh, richly blessed Esau was from uh, his father's blessing. So his father's blessing really made him prosperous. So he, so he was able to finally let go of the bitterness. He was content with what he had. Verse 10, And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. Uh, Jacob says to Esau, No, uh, I'm begging you, I pray you, if I found grace in your sight, in your eyes, please receive my presence, my gift, from, from me at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God. Just stop, man. Just stop. <laughs> He's kissing his butt, man. <laughs> Why receive this gift at my hand? Because I, I've seen your face as if I saw the face of God himself. And thou was pleased with me, and you were pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee because God hath dealt graciously with me. Please take, I'm begging you, my blessing, Jacob's blessing, that is given to you, because God's the one that dealt graciously with me. He gave me all this blessing, and I want to give it to you, and because I have enough. Uh, so actually, uh, right here, Jacob says, because I have enough, please take it. Please take it. I got, I'm the one that has enough. You should have more. And he urged him, and he took it. So Jacob urged Esau, and then Esau eventually took it. If there's one thing uh, you learn about Esau, so I wrote some of this out. That way we can follow along this story. We first saw how Jacob greeted Esau. He was just kissing his tail, kissing his feet, you know, because he was totally scared, and God just... Uh, went against his fears every single time, his plans every single time. Jacob still won't learn. Verse 8 through 11, Esau, notice right here, he never rejected an offer, a deal. He received it. Now, did you hear what I said? He never turned down an offer or a deal. He received it. That was Esau's problem. You remember? Uh, let's go back. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Chapter 26. Genesis chapter 25, excuse me, chapter 25. Remember, that's why Esau gave up his, I mean, it's sad, 
his birthright. That is God's blessing to him. But Esau could never turn down a deal, even if it's just a bowl of chili. That's really, you would think that's a really stupid move on his part. A permanent eternal birthright for just a, for just a meal. But that shows his fleshly side. Genesis 25, uh, verse 32. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? Verse 34, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink. Uh, the last part, thus Esau despised his birthright. At that problem, he never could turn down a gift or a deal from Jacob. We're going to go to, let's see right here. But if you recall the passage from Hebrews, uh, Esau, the Bible says, was a very fleshly character. He was basically, they put him in line with fornication. Even though we don't see the actual sin right here of fornication, but the idea is he was a very fleshly person. He can never leave that. He always had to have a gift in his hand. That's why even though he supposedly uh, tried to repent carefully with tears, the Bible said that uh, his repentance didn't count because it was an actual repentance. Uh, remember, I told you that repentance is not something hard to do. But the reason why Esau's repentance did not count is because he was a very fleshly person. Deep down inside, all he wanted was an offer. All he wanted was a deal and a gift. He didn't really mean his repentance. He didn't really want the blessing or the birthright. Even though Esau said that, didn't Jacob trick me? And uh, he stole my birthright and the blessing. Well, that's only half true because Esau, uh, Jacob didn't actually steal. Esau willingly gave it up. Esau willingly gave it up. So Esau, even though he says, I have enough, he still took the gift. Uh, that's not the attitude that a true Christian should do. If you look at 2 Kings 5, 2 Kings chapter 5. Elisha the prophet, when he was offered a gift, he actually did not receive it. He rejected it. 2 Kings chapter 5. But Esau couldn't turn down a gift, even though he claimed he had enough. He always had that nature inside. If there's one thing we learn about the flesh is, in Esau's case, even though you think that uh, living in this world and satisfying your flesh is all there is to live, you can even satisfy it supposedly to the fullest and even give the statement, you know, I'm happy with what I have. And you'll hear these uh, liars on TV who have all the money, all the wealth, and they said, I got enough. I'm very happy with what I have. But no, it's, uh, it's not. Even though Esau will say, I have enough, he still received the gift. Human nature is they will still receive the gift even though they think that they have enough. So that's very dangerous about the flesh. The dangerous thing about the flesh is, one, you are never contented. Okay? okay? It's an empty hole. Number two, even though you think you're contented, uh, you're still not content deep down inside. That's the dangerous thing about the flesh. Flesh is, uh, the more that I study this flesh, the more I find it very interesting, but the more cursed and weak I realize. 2 Kings chapter 5. And then we'll see right here that the Bible points out in verse, let's see, 15, 15. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. And came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Notice right here that Elisha stood his ground and did not accept the blessing, the gift from Naaman. But Esau did not do that. Why? His his heart was never uh, in the Lord to begin with anyway. If his heart was in the Lord, then he would be able to say no. But Esau, all he was thinking about is a worldly perspective, a fleshly perspective. I got riches. I got all the prosperity. I have enough. 
So that's his problem. Let's go to Genesis 33 again. Genesis 33. Dr. Upman said right here that Esau is the first man in the Bible to say, I have enough. So that's kind of interesting. A fleshly man would be the one to give that statement, I have enough. But as we've seen in the book of Hebrews, he's a lost man who went to hell. It's very sad. Lost man who went to hell. The world might think they even have enough, even though that's not really true. To be quite honest, they never have enough. But even the rare chance it does happen where the person says, I have enough, deep down inside it isn't. They go to hell at the end. They lose it all. That's why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? See, even if you have enough of all the world, but lose his own soul. Let's go right here at Genesis 33 and then verse 12. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. So Esau says to Jacob, hey, let's take our journey. Let's, all, let's both go together, and I'm going to go in front of you and lead the way. Verse 13, and he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender. So Jacob, he responds to Esau. Now notice this response. He says, he calls Esau my Lord, and he says, You know that the children that I have, they're very tender. So they're not strong. They're not fit. And the flocks and herds with young are with me. So I got flocks and herds as well as well as the young children. So I got to be gentle. They're all tender. They're not fit. They're not like grown men where they can make the journey, catch up to your speed. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. He says, if you and your foot soldiers here, your men, uh, all in one day, you just uh, drive them over. That's the idea. You go on overdrive, right? So you don't need a plainer English translation than that. If you over, put them on overdrive all in one day, then all the flock will die. Jacob still fears his brother Esau, and he never fixed his lying attitude. So Jacob had no intention to go with Esau, you're going to find out at the end of the chapter. He instead lies to his older brother again, and uh, tries to go to a different direction. He should have trusted God, but instead of trusting God, he just lied in front of his brother's face and tricked him again. I mean, it's a wonder Esau didn't kill Jacob, you know? I mean, this guy just keeps lying. Let's keep reading here. Verse 14, Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me. Uh, he says right here, so I want, my, uh, let my Lord, I beg you, pass over before your own servant. So go on ahead of your servant here. Go ahead of me and I'll carry on, lead my group softly, so tenderly, not as hard, not as strong as you guys are leading the way. I'm going to lead softly according as the cattle that go up before me and the children be able to endure. He says, I'm going to basically lead my group softly at the pace of the cattle that are uh, going in front of me and the, how much the children are able to tolerate, they're able to put up with. Until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. So I'm going to carry on at this soft pace, this slow pace, until uh, I meet my Lord, you Esau, at the location of Seir. Seir is a place where Esau lives. So Jacob insists that he's going to go at that pace. Verse 15, And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. Now Esau, he just, uh, he's just overjoyed to see Jacob. All he wants is his younger brother to be with him. So he says, uh, I'm going to leave some of my uh, folk. I'm going to leave some of my men to be with you, to help you out. But then uh, Jacob says, and he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. Jacob says, there's no need of it. Well, what's the need for it? Uh, please let me find grace in your eyes in my sight and grant my request. Let me just go by this pace. Oh uh, boy. Verse 16. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. So Esau, 
At that same day, he returned on his way back to his home in Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, so he went a different direction. And built him a house and made booths for his cattle. So he went to a different uh, direction called Succoth, and then he built himself a house, and then he made booths for his cattle to take care of them. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. So because of the booths that he made for his cattle, that's why he called the name of that place Succoth. So that's what it means. It means booths, actually. So I think the Jews, they have a feast that is similar to that name, Succoth or Succoth, something like that. That's why he was able to give that name. To explain the direction of how Jacob was traveling will be as follows. So I got a map over here. I'm going to draw a little mini map. So remember, he's coming from Syria, okay? Which is Padanaram. Remember the uh, city name that he came out of? So Padanaram. I'm assuming they can read all of that. It's a long ways, okay? But because this map is uh, so small, I'm just going to make it shorter, the distance. Catches up to Gilead. If you recall, that's uh, Laban uh, meets Jacob. Then we carry on to Peniel. Now, Peniel right here is where Jacob, he was uh, wrestling uh, with the angel of the Lord. He got some things right with God. Now, some of you might be wondering, where is Edom then? Where is Seir? So Mount Seir is actually further south of that Dead Sea. So if I draw the Dead Sea, then you'll kind of get an idea. So it will go up to, let's see right here, the Jordan River, and then Peniel, and then right here is the Sea of Galilee. So the Dead Sea is right here. Peniel and Gilead is that way. It's like a little bit north toward the east side. Because remember, Syria is way east. It's pretty far away over there. So Gilead, Peniel. Then we come to the Dead Sea over here. And then Mount Seir is south of Israel. So it's located here. So that's how far away it is. Then how far did uh, Jacob go? He's not going to go south to where his brother is. He went this way. He's going opposite. So, he's, so here goes Jacob. He's going south originally. Then his brother catches up to him. So then Jacob got scared. So he, if Esau didn't meet him, Jacob would have probably kept going south. But because Esau meets him right here, Jacob gets so scared that he says, okay, we're all going to a different direction. We're going this way. So he goes this direction, and that's where Succoth is. So he goes west. He goes west. Then Bethel is a little bit south over here. Okay, with this uh, picture in mind, you kind of get an idea of Jacob, what direction he intended and what was going on. If we keep that picture in mind, let's read verse 18, then and I'll explain further. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. Okay, so when he's going toward Sukkoth and Shechem, it's right here. So it's within the same locality that he's going. He goes to Shalem, which is Shechem's city. So the idea is the city that he went to 
is Shalem. That way there's no confusion here. The scholars got confused, actually. So then they claim that it's a mistranslation. So then they'll put this as a metaphor rather than literally a name of a city. But they haven't been reading. So let me explain right here. So Jacob, he goes to the city called Shalem. And that's close to city of peace, the meaning. It's kind of synonymous or very close to that. He goes to Shalem, which is a city of Shechem. So scholars think that Shechem is a literal name of a place, but then already you got a place called Shalem, and then you got Sukkot, which makes it very confusing. No, the idea is this. That's why even in the location right here, we get a city name, and then within the city name, then you get a district name inside it, or a certain block uh, name, or a, even a street name. Sometimes people will do that. The idea is Jacob's place in verse 17, place, right? He called this Sukkot. The city that he's in is Shalem. Shechem, it doesn't have to be a city of a county called Shechem, all right? There's no such thing. It's actually the name of a person who owns the city because the simple answer is when you read verse 19, all right? The children of Hamor, Shechem's father. See, so Shechem is the, uh, the Lord or the leader in charge of that territory. Chapter 34 is all about Shechem, okay? You're going to find out. Uh, something bad happens. So Shechem is the name of a person. This is the name of a city. This is the name of Jacob's place. So that's the idea of what's going on. So let me read again verse 18. Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. So he is in the whole land of Canaan or the land of what was soon to be later called in the books, uh, in the time of Moses, Israel, Israel. So he's in Canaan. When he came from Paddan Aram, so he came all the way from uh, the east side, northeast, which is Syria, Paddan Aram is the name of the city, Laban, that he lived with, and pitched his tent before the city. So then he pitched his, cent, uh, his tent before the city of Shechem. I guess what I'll do is I'll keep reading and then I'll explain the entire passage. Verse 19, and he bought a parcel of a field. So he buys a piece of ground, obviously. That's the meaning, where he had spread his tent. So at this uh, piece of property he bought, he spreads his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor. So he bought it from the hand of the children of Hamor. Hamor is Shechem's father. So Hamor is the father of Shechem. So this guy is the son who uh, owns some territory himself, being a prince. For a hundred pieces of money. So then Jacob bought the property for what the Bible calls hundred pieces of money, uh, their own economic price that time. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. So he erects an altar, so he builds up an altar to worship God and then calls the uh, name of that place, uh, I think the meaning is God of God of Israel or something close to that effect. Because Israel is his new name. And Jacob has to give a commitment, a dedication to the Lord and then builds a place to him. Why? He cannot forget that incident at Genesis 32. At Genesis 32, the Lord dealt with him. So Jacob, he has to build a place where he commits to God. But also, this is very important, which a lot of Christians need to learn from this lesson. Because Jacob remembered that vow he made long time ago. If you go back to Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Because Jacob did the same thing when God met with him and then he builds up an altar and then he makes a vow that if you are able to bless me, you put me in my father's home in peace, then I'm going to worship you. You're going to be my God. I'm going to set up a place to worship you. That's the idea. 
if you look at verse 18, Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. So that's house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. Now, notice where Bethel is. It's not there. Bethel is here. Okay? Why? He's just afraid to go closer to where his older brother is. So he wants to get a little bit further north, far away as possible. Jacob made a vow back at Genesis 28. This stone, he built... He already set up uh, an altar, so to speak, or a monument over there. Okay? He already set it up right there. It was at Bethel. And he said, this stone, this pillar, this will be the place where I worship you. Now, that's what Jacob committed to the Lord. So then, notice, he, there's no doubt he disobeyed God when he went toward this direction. Because he was afraid. Now, the evidence that he disobeyed God and, <coughs> and the evidence Jacob set up a different place of worship is because the name, the name he called it house of God at verse 19, right? Over here, he called it a house of God. But then right here, he calls it in chapter 33, verse 20, he, he would go, God of, God of Israel, you know. Why do you need to put like two G's over there, two gods over there? It's like this place is actually better. That's the idea. Why would he name it that way? Name it that way. So the house of, uh, house of God is right here, but then he puts like the, the God of, God of Israel or the house, uh, the God of, God of <laughs> Israel's house. Right here. The, the naming is so weird how he would do that. So it makes it sound like that Jacob, he knows he's outside of God's will, but he's thinking, Lord, I'm going to make sure that this place is better for you. When I make my commitment to you, I can't follow up with my commitment to you. But, but you know, Lord, even though I am going on a different direction, my own choice and my own way of doing things, I'm going to make sure it will bring you greater glory. Now, that's a lot with our Christian attitude in life, right? There's something that we make a commitment to God, and there's something that God expects from our lives. But we don't want to follow through that. We insist in going our own direction and our own way of doing things. But uh, because of that commitment we give to the Lord, we try to make up an excuse by saying, but Lord, I can serve you better in this one. And we follow up. We try to uh, put all our heart and soul into it. But the Lord said, that's not the deal that I made with you. It was right here. It was right here. Why are you going to a different route? Another evidence is chapter 35, verse 1. Notice that uh, God, he tells Jacob to go to Bethel and dwell there. So God says to Jacob, I want, I, don't stay in Succoth. I want you to go to Bethel. And then you're going to live there. And verse 1, make there an altar unto God. See, so God wasn't pleased with this previous altar, that means. You'll notice that at uh, chapter 33, verse 20, when he built that altar, it never shows that God ever accepted that. God never accepted that. But if you look at uh, chapter 35 and then verse 1, that's where God wanted it. I want the altar to be built there. I want it to be built there. At Bethel. Another thing that we notice why Jacob was certainly outside of God's will, and we can tell, let's see right here.
chapter 33, verse 18. Now look at that wording there, okay? And then go to Genesis 13, Genesis 13. Jacob was following an example of somebody else, of the place where he wanted to go. Genesis 13. The wording is pretty strange. Chapter 33, verse 18. The last part reads, chapter 33, verse 18. The last part reads, and pitched his tent before the city. Now, if you recall that phrase, that phrase is used in reference to Lot, who pitched his tent before Sodom. And we've, uh, preachers have used that phrase to, as a reference to worldly Christians. Are you pitching your tent before Sodom? Same thing with Jacob's case. It matches. He pitches uh, his tent toward the world. Let's look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 12. Chapter 13, verse 12. The last part reads, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. See that? Pitched his tent towards Sodom. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to chapter 33. Let's go back to chapter 33. Another thing that we can see is in chapter uh, 33, notice that verse 17 says Jacob built him a house, right? He intended to live there. He intended to live there. Now, that's not, that's not a place where God wanted him to live because if you go to chapter 35, verse 1, chapter 35, verse 1, God said, go up to Bethel and what? Dwell there. He wanted him to live there. So there's no doubt that Jacob was not in the place where God wanted him to be. That's the bottom line. And that we can see the reason why he went that way. It was fear of his brother Esau. When we go back to chapter 33, when we go back to chapter 33, Esau, uh, excuse me, Jacob was actually in the right where he wasn't going with his brother to his brother's location. Why? God had to put a boundary. God had to say, your people, your own nation, your people. Uh, Jacob's people cannot mingle with Esau's people. That's a big no-no. But, Jacob, he didn't have to lie to Esau out of fear that way, being a sneaky coward. There's no doubt that Jacob, that he was going by his own way of doing things because of his lying uh, attitude, personality at 12 verse 15, and then also because of his disobedience from verses 16 through 20. So there's no doubt that Jacob, he was relying on his secular humanistic way of doing things once more. Okay, let's go to chapter 34 now. Chapter 34. And then we'll read verse 1. Jacob's decision is making him reap what he sowed. Chapter 34 is probably the best chapter, uh, probably not, not the best, but the most horrific chapter that proves Jacob truly reaped what he sowed. If you thought Laban's case was rough, if you thought um, his case with Esau was rough, or even later on in the future, his case where uh, his own sons deceived him about Joseph was rough, believe it or not, this is probably the most horrific proof, chapter 34, that you truly reap what you sow. So Jacob would not, I mean, he did not repent. He had an experience with God at chapter 32. The most dangerous thing a Christian can do is after your experience with God and you still go to your own way of doing things, your humanistic ways, the price you're paying is going to be really big. It's going to be really big. And God don't have to do anything to be honest. God don't have to do anything. In this chapter, you don't see God involved one bit. It's just truly the case of you eat the fruit of your action because you thought this was the best way of doing things. So let's see if Jacob's plan going here was truly the best for him. That was the best for him, the best idea. I'm going to worship God even better right here. Well, let's see. Chapter 34, verse 1. And Dina, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. So remember, Jacob has a daughter, for some of you who've forgotten her. Uh, Dina, she was born from Leah. And uh, the verse says right here, it's self-explanatory. Dina is Leah's daughter. Uh, and Leah was the one who gave birth, the one who bore Leah to Jacob. 
she went outside to just see all the daughters of the land, so all the other daughters within that territory. She wanted to make friends, explore the neighborhood, right? Uh, what harm can go into that? Uh, will it make any parent not allow their daughter to go around the neighborhood and say hi to people when you read this chapter? Verse 2, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So Shechem, the guy who's a prince of that territory, he's the son of Hamor, and Hamor is a Hivite. So the Hivites, you're going to see uh, that uh, group of people mentioned several times throughout the books of Moses. They're a group of people that became Israel's enemies. So Shechem, who is uh, Hamor's son, he's the prince of the country. When he saw Dina, then he took her and then uh, he lay with her and then he obviously defiled her. So he, it's pretty obvious from the text he raped her. Now, the disturbing thing is this. The disturbing thing is I looked at the timeline and Dina's age that time. Most scholars actually grew, agree with this. Scholars agree with this. But the exact age, if you want the exact age, then I'm going to show you something. Let's assume that uh, Usher's chronology and timeline is right, and Bible believers usu usually go by Usher's chronology. So if you have a Ruckman reference Bible or a Schofield reference Bible, it'll go by Usher's chronology. You look at that date right there, right? It's B.C. what? 1739, right? Okay, then let's see when Dina was born, okay? We're going to go to chapter 30. Chapter 30. And verse 21, chapter 30, verse 21. When you look at chapter 30 and verse uh, 21, and afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dina. So that's her birth, okay? So her birth is in B.C. 1753. So let's, calc let's give some calculations right here. So if it's 1753... And then we subtracted by 1739. Then we can see her age right here. So she was like 24 when that happened, right? Is that the idea? 14. She wasn't at the age of consent, so to speak. She was 14. Most scholars agree she was either between the ages of 13 through 15 that time. 13 through 15. So it's a horrible thing. And this came about because of Jacob's in insisting his own way of doing things. Of serving God. That's his excuse. I'm going to serve God even better. Uh, the problem with human nature that we never, ever learn is that even if God breaks your leg and cripples you for life, you still don't learn your lesson. And we don't even count the price that, look, sin is not going to affect you. That's a very selfish mentality that, that you think sin is going to affect you. It affects your children. It affects your children. What you think is harmless, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going here, Lord. I'm going to go a different location. <laughs> Pay the heavy price. Every wrong decision you make, even though you don't think it's a big deal, it will be a big deal. It can hurt your children. It, you have to be very, uh, we are not mature adults. The more I realize it, the more I study this flesh. We are not mature adults. Everybody thinks that when you get to college, you're grown up enough and you're adult enough and you can uh, make your own decisions. And if you make mistakes, you just learn from it. <laughs> yeah, you learn from it, but uh, a lot of times you are still very stubborn that you refuse to learn from it. Another thing is you don't want to even make the same mistakes, but they encourage that for an independent mindset or attitude. All right, that's the horrible thing about human nature. Horrible thing about human nature. You got to realize this. You just don't learn from your mistakes, and you don't, you're not the only one paying the price. It's your children. It's a very selfish thing that makes me very upset uh, with the, our generation and our human nature is we always never think about our children. Never. 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 We don't. We don't think that the decisions that I make that it, it will hurt my children one day. 
We never think about that. And God didn't do that as a punishment. This comes about just because of a wrong choice. If he follow God's will, hey, I know it's safer for you here. I know this is the best decision. If you go any other place, then you're going to be in trouble. But Jacob just uh, went to his own place, his own choice of doing things. Remember this is that uh, if you're eating the fruit of your own ways, it's never God's fault. You, you don't credit it to God. It's always your fault because God didn't even have to get involved to begin with when you wish he was involved. A lot of times you'd be more grateful if God was more involved in uh, your things because you can claim Romans 8, 28 more easily. You can trust God more easily. It may not be as bad so easily. But uh, if you uh, don't want God to be involved in your way of doing things in life, then chapter 34, you'll, I don't want you to ever forget chapter 34. That is probably one of the most horf horrific things I ever see in Jacob's life, what he reaped, what he sowed. But he's not done yet. The reaping and sowing continues, okay? You thought the raping of a, uh, his uh, underage uh, girl is worse enough? It's not. Fruit of your wrong decisions make it far worse. Verse 3, And his soul clave unto Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. Okay, so he's a creep. Okay, he's not a good guy. Uh, his soul, you know, clave unto Dina. The idea of claving is like, you know, like sticking to Dina. Like he's becoming one with her. Isn't that sounds so romantic, doesn't it? You know, Dina is Jacob's daughter. He loved the damsel. And then he even speaks uh, kindly to uh, the damsel. Uh, for uh, your daughters nowadays, if they ever get messed up with uh, these uh, men, which is are wicked men, and they do act like the Romeo at verse 3, and they do say that they love, uh, you don't know what that love is. Go to 1 Samuel. Yeah. Go to 2 Samuel, excuse me. 2 Samuel. If you ever have a teenage daughters or a girl that's going out with the wrong guy, then this is the chapter you should teach them. This is the chapter that you should teach them. Go to the book of 2 Samuel, and then we'll look at chapter 13. Chapter 13. Notice right here that Amnon loved uh, Tamar. He loved. The Bible says loved. He, uh, it's interesting. It didn't say rape. The Bible didn't say rape. It says love. But we know plainly from the passage at Genesis that it was rape. So that's uh, why the Lord's trying to teach you of the world's perspective of doing things. What they call, you know, fornication or other things, uh, they call it love. But the Bible will show you what this love is in their eyes. Verse 4. The second part of verse 4 of 2 Samuel 13. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar. My brother Absalom's sister. Oh, doesn't that sound romantic? You know how romantic this is? Verse 2. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. Oh, isn't that romantic? What a Romeo passage. I know some of you are disgusted, but I'll be honest with you. If you are in that situation and scenario, and if you were that... Uh, uh, immature boy and immature girl in that scenario, you don't truly see the disgust in this. You see the romantic side to this. The verse is, he fell sick for her. Oh, isn't that romantic? Now look what the Bible shows right here. In your eyes, it seems like love and it's very romantic. But actually, the Bible will show you later, uh, later on, verse 15, verse 15. So he rapes Tamar. And after that, verse 15, just one night with her. Just one romantic night. Look at verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. What, you know what the problem with this guy is? It's not that he truly loved her. He was fleshly. He was impulsive. 
That's the bottom line. What these teenagers and the young people, you know, they nonchalantly call love, throw out love nowadays. No, it's being impulsive. It's fleshly. That's the wickedness of sin. All right, let's go back to Genesis. That's the same case with uh, Shechem. Now, Shechem, I mean, this guy was like, no, I really love her. I want to give her the best. I want to marry her. I'll do anything for her. Now, in the world's eyes, you know, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? It sounds like a Romeo. But that's, what, that's the fruit of it of chapter 34. That's the fruit of it of chapter 34. Your children become like that because of a wrong decision you parents make. Well, uh, you, were, you yielded to the impulse of your flesh, but the children, they do it exceedingly. What parents do in moderation, children do in excess, the saying goes. So they become, so they, what happens is the impulsivity, the fleshliness is tenfold more than your own wrong decision of the flesh. Verse 4, and Shechem spake Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. So Shechem tells his dad, Hamor, hey, I want this young girl, this damsel, this young virgin, uh, for my wife. Verse 5, and Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter. Now his father was in battle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. So Jacob heard the news that uh, Shechem raped, corrupted his own daughter, Dina. And at that time, he and his boys were with the cattle out in the field. And Jacob, you know, he held his peace. In other words, he kept it all in. You know, he kept back his anger until Hamor and Shechem came to them. Uh, came to them. Verse 6, And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. So Hamor, Shechem's dad, goes to Jacob to commune, to talk to him, make a deal. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. So when, they, uh, so when Hamor talks to Jacob, Jacob's sons who are out in the field taking care of the cattle, they hear it. They hear what Hamor is saying to their dad Jacob. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying uh, with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. You'll... Uh, notice right here that the boys, the sons of Jacob, at verse 7, they were very, uh, when they heard what Hamor is saying to Jacob, they were grieved inside. And then they were also very angry, wroth. That's, and then, why? Because Shechem wrought folly. The idea is, is that he brought this folly. He brought this shame upon Israel in lying with uh, Jacob's daughter, in lying with Dina, which thing ought not to be done, which is basically common sense. This shouldn't even happen. This shouldn't even occur. But immature, premature attitudes nowadays from youth, they just condone any lifestyle now. Even though common sense dictates it ought not to be done. You know what? <laughs> this is actually even more messed up that I can't believe. If you... The first mention of the land of Israel or Israel as a place is this verse, verse 7. What a way to start. The land of Israel is where my daughter got raped. It said right here, verse 7, in Israel. Remember, Israel is Jacob's name. It was never called Israel to begin with. When Jacob started, can you believe that? When he chose his own location. From now on, this is the land of Israel, and I'm going to worship you, God, better than ever before, and that happened. What a way to start. What a way to start, isn't it? That's, that's horrifying. Chapter 34 is just one of those most horrific chapters that I ever read in the Bible. If you look at verse 8, And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife. Hamor communes with uh, Jacob and his people. His boys are with his people. And he says to them, my son Saul, she, uh, Shechem, longs for your daughter. 
because he has to not just talk to the dad because the dad represents the whole nation, the people of Israel, right? So he has to talk to all of them. And he refers to, he realizes it's not just Jacob's daughter, but basically all the nation's daughter. That's the idea. Your daughter. So I'm begging you, give uh, Dina to Shechem as his wife. Verse 9, and make ye marriages with us and give your daughters unto us and take our daughters unto you. There's no doubt Hamar is speaking to the entire community, not just Jacob alone to his entire nation because he makes this national dealing, so to speak. Uh, diplomatic relations, man. Uh, what a horrible thing. He says, uh, I want, why don't you marry our people and then uh, give your daughters to us and then we're going to take your daughters for ourselves too. Verse 10, And ye shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein and get you possessions therein. Hamor offers them, hey, you, you can live with us. The land will be in front of you. you can, the land will be yours. Live here. Uh, make businesses right here. Start businesses in this area and get yourself possessions as well. So therein means in there, obviously. Uh, we will end it right here. We will end it right here. But the reaping and sowing continues. And I'm going to show you a little surprise of the reaping and sowing Jacob got was truly directly a consequence from his action, not just a coincidence or what God deliberately put. It is truly a follow-up of a direct consequence of his own actions, which is why we have to be extremely careful with how we act nowadays. Because uh, secular lost people even believe with, that when, even if God doesn't exist, Every action we make has consequences. Psychologists and uh, people who take care of children always say this, that children take something after their parents. Every action has a consequence. Chapter 34 is a horrific result of that, and I will definitely prove that next Genesis study. Now, Father, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your word, what we can glean, what we can read, what we can learn, uh, even not just good stuff, but even the bad stuff, Heavenly Father, is important to be mentioned in the Scripture so that we can learn such valuable lesson and not repeat such horrific consequences upon our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.